Welcome everyone to this session about creating uh, seed sovereignty declarations. We're excited to go from a lot of learning and engagement to focus on action and what we can do as the slow food movement and as individuals in um, you know, collective action. How do we come together and, and act based on what we've heard for the last few days here? So I'm excited to welcome Clayton um, to lead us off in a short presentation. He's going to talk about his experience creating seed sovereignty declarations. Um, and then we can also turn it over to Don. Don, you and I haven't touched base yet, but thank you for being here. Um, and what we want to do is have a more open-ended conversation about what we can do together. So I'll actually invite people to join us on the screen later on to talk and talk about what your response has been. Um, so that's the, the, the layout of the next hour or so. Let me just give you a little background on Clayton before I turn it over to him. Clayton is a founding member of and program director of the a traditional Native American Farmers Association. He's also a member of the Slow Food Turtle Island Association, which is the indigenous run collective of slow food in North America. And he's a farmer and collecting and saving seeds today as we speak. He has a, a pile of corn behind him. So I'm excited, Clayton, to hear your, your experiences. I'm gonna go off screen. Um, Jeff and Don, you can go off video for now, just during this presentation, and then we'll come back in just a few minutes. So over to you, Clayton. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Uh, good day, everyone. Um, again, my name is Clayton Brockope, uh, Program Director for Nonprofit Traditional Native American Farmers Association. And um, I do quite a, many different things, but um, today's topic is about um i i guess um securing our seeds protecting our seeds and a little bit of seed conservation so um i've got a real short uh um powerpoint presentation there's no reading it's just images so next <clears throat> uh this is our um association's logo and again it uh reflects our um some of our belief and understanding of um, of seeds, uh, corn especially. Um, there's many different land races of corns, and uh, what we I understand, or I've been told, is that uh, corn also represents um, uh, the directions, the uh, sacred directions, and humanity itself. Next slide. That's where our uh, original logo came from. Uh, so we do grow. Um, not just these four, but many other varieties of corn and other um, crops. Next. <clears throat> um, the, I guess the, the genius or the beauty of um, our ancestors in creating these, um, these foods, these seeds that we um, still cultivate and enjoy it's a, a relationship between um, um, humans and plants, um, and it's a it's a relationship that we depend on them, and they also depend on us. Uh, so when we're talking about seeds, we're we're actually addressing it in a deeper um, uh, frame of mind. I'll say that um, it's not. It, the seeds aren't just something that maybe you would see in a, in a catalog or purchase and grow them out and um, you know and then buy new seeds next year. They they go um, further and further back into our histories. They actually, many of these seeds are um, a part of our creation stories. Next slide. Uh, these are just some examples of the diversity. These are beans and um, so the, our main crops with um, uh, the indigenous people of the, in North America, Turtle Island is corn, beans, and squash. There are others, but those are the uh, main, I guess, um, uh, foundation of our uh, of our, um, our our wealth and our um, our health and our, and the diversity that we 
um, try best to maintain. <clears throat> Next slide, please. This is another just a close up of some of the seeds that we maintain, that we grow, and we also consume. Next. Uh, diversity again, some pumpkins. Um, the, the three crops that I just mentioned, um, uh, they're pollinated in, in the uh, wind. Self, some are, uh, beans are self-pollinated, the insect pollination. So um, we're covering um, those methods in, uh, to grow our seed next. Diversity again, can't get enough pictures of corn. Just a, a reminder of the, um, not only the, the beauty of the corn, but the sacredness and also um, how our seeds um, adapt and have adapted to um, so many different um, ecological uh, circumstances. Some are grown at sea levels, some are grown above uh, 10,000 feet, uh, short season, long season, et cetera. So that's, um, uh, next slide. Uh, this is one of our uh, main crops that we grow here. I actually have some sitting next to me. <clears throat> um, we're just past midwinters um, here in northern New Mexico, and we're still cleaning some seeds, getting it prepared to be sending out to um, farmers, new gardeners, and so forth. Next slide. Uh, again, just some diversity here, um, different flavors, different um, um, requirements for each of these. Again, they're representing um, uh, us as, uh, as, as humanity, just like humans, we don't, there's not just one type of human being, there's so many different uh, um, types of human beings with uh, different needs, different um, special traits and special um, uh, str um, strength and even weaknesses. Next slide. This is uh, one of our cornfields. This is actually from last year. We're in a drought uh, last year in northern New Mexico, but um, you know because of the, the seeds that we are maintaining and able to grow and to select um, the, the proper one for each of these seasons, we, uh, we did actually uh, produce very, um, very good. These are all hand, hand um, done um, fields, hand planted, uh, hand, hand cultivated and harvested. Next. The, um, the, the seeds, the crops that we grow, um, they're for a lot of different purposes. Um, corn, um, we, we grow for, for the seed, we grow it for food, uh, for the humans. Um, some of it goes to the livestock and there's other parts that are also harvested. And um, so we need to maintain, um, I guess, the, uh, the integrity of, of each of these uh, um, varieties, these land races. And, uh, some uh, at certain times of year will harvest the pollen. We'll harvest the um, uh, the silk for medicine. Uh, we harvest the cobs for different uses, and uh, and in some cases we we harvest the the stock itself for other purposes. Next slide. Uh, just another shot of uh, the uh, the flower of the uh, of the corn. Next. <clears throat> The silks, and I, I took this again last year. We try to maintain um, uh, good, healthy, clean uh, fields with uh, no artificial inputs. So we invite uh, beneficial insects, and you'll see uh, uh, the ladybugs are enjoying uh, the company of the uh, of the corn. Next slide. <clears throat> So the, uh, um, this is one part of our harvest from last year, uh, again, diversity, but also one of the things um, that we've do been doing as uh, the traditional Native American Farmers Association, but also we've collaborated with other 
um, indigenous organizations. We um, created uh, uh, Slow Food Turtle Island Association. And in Northern Mexico, there are other um, uh, local land-based uh, communities, the Hispanic farmers, and we're uh, creating coalitions, collaborations, and alliances uh, with them to protect um, our, our, you know, our seed, but it also uh, reflects our health um, and our wealth and our um, ability to be who we are. Next slide. Again, um, just next. <laughs> Diversity, next, in squashes. Diversity, next slide. Um, again, uh, squashes are um, insect pollinated um, and just illustrating the, uh, uh, some of the, uh, the, the, the male flower. These are edible. So our seed produces, um, again, the genius of our ancestors that um, most of the, all of our um, uh, cultivars that have been handed to us can be consumed um, in, in their immature stage, such as these um, blossoms. They can be harvested um, in their, their mid-adult and then in their maturity. Next slide. So these are the things that we need to be protecting. Uh, that's the female blossom that will produce the the the, uh, the fruits. Next. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Uh, bees. Again, we're protecting uh, health and integrity of our fields by trying to maintain uh, um, uh, natural or uh, biological uh, organic standards. So we we're encouraging um, insects into our fields, both uh, beneficial and sometimes uh, we, we get um, some that are not as beneficial to us in particular. Next slide. Uh, harvesting the, the, the male blossom. So this is a, a part of the um, production from the seeds also. Next slide. Uh, cutting open a squash. Uh, we're going to be eating the flesh. Next slide. And uh, harvesting the seeds. The seeds can also be eaten or um, uh, saved uh, for, for the next season, gifted out or um, shared with other um, uh, members in our, in our farming community. Next slide. Uh, there's different ways that we've learned how to clean seeds, take care of seeds, store and uh, protect them. Next. One of the um, ways that we, um, I guess, protect or uh, grow um, the seeds so that they'll maintain pure lines is actually by using um, what we call border plants. Uh, we've integrated this, these particular winter squash with corn. And uh, it's all the next um, field over, the next border over, it'll have a different type of squash growing. Uh, and we haven't seen um, any major crossings in, by using this method. Next. Next slide. Uh, uh, these are just fields of next, um, next slide, okay. Um, this is um, some of my family. We're doing the initial cleaning of seeds in the field. There'll be, uh, these are beans, um, and then we'll thrash them there, rough cleaning, and then um, move uh, closer to our homes, and then uh, put away until we can clean them, uh, sort them, and um, um, provide them as either food or uh, either a seed grade or a food grade. Next slide. And again, these are all old, old varieties. Uh, we're um, being able to teach these methods in practice to our, our young people. And as part of our association, and as part of our seed alliance here in Northern Mexico, this is one of the ways that we're uh, continuing to um, um, hold on to and um, keep our seeds um, in our communities 
in our hands and uh, um, within our regions. Next slide. Uh, just another shot of uh, real basic ways of cleaning seeds. Next slide. One more. Next slide. Um, in, we've, we utilize in some of our fields a polyculture. Uh, so we've got um, corn, we got squash, we got sunflowers, uh, watermelons, and I believe there's two types of beans going in this, uh, this polyculture. Next slide. Um, and so the, the, the end result uh, uh, is that we get to eat the foods that we, um, in, uh, our ancestors have enjoyed, that we enjoy. These um, older cultivars, we've seen studies time and time again that they're superior in nutrition, flavors, and um, adapt to the, uh, sometimes the severity of our climates, um, and that can be in anywhere, uh, uh, cold climates, hot climates, dry climates, and so forth. Those seeds are um, uh, vital for our, our survival. So that's one of the reasons why we need it. We need to protect, um, one is um, making sure we have them in our communities, looking for the ones that may, may have been missing in our communities, um, growing them out, teaching our, um, our communities, our young people, how to um, grow them out um, well to produce good seed and then to uh, store them and then to protect them from, uh, I guess, uh, uh, perhaps other entities out there that wish to control our seeds. Next slide. Was there another one or no? Yeah, that was the end. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought there was one more. Um, so with that, the I was saying um, there's, we created, and I believe someone put a link for the, um, I'll get the correct, I don't want to, uh, Declaration of Seed Sovereignty. Um, from the New Mexico, um, New Mex yeah, Declaration of Seed Sovereignty, uh, uh, New Mexico Aseki Association, and also right after that, this was in 2006, we created the New Mexico Seed Sovereignty Alliance on this, actually on this particular day. So that um, we're, we're, we put out a statement in, um, and how this came about, it was actually just conversations for probably about four years um, with this um, this loose uh, loose knit group of uh, farmers in northern New Mexico. Uh, so some of them were elders, some of them were uh, people that were um, just youth getting into uh, ag and wanted to um, ensure that they could. Um, have um, good health and so forth. And um, there's a link to it. Uh, it's also on our website. From this document, um, the, a number of other documents were, um, were created. And I have a, um, a, a list of them here in this book. Um, and there's a few more that are missing, but basically, um, we were trying to address um, the education and the need to um, educate our um, our tribal leadership, but our political leadership also in the state that um, we needed our seeds to be protected. Primarily at that point was from um, the threat of GMO seeds. The, um, this, some uh, people in the state still are trying to pass laws um, that inhibit our ability to um, have that control over our seeds. So uh, with that, I think um, I can, we can open up the floor to questions or to, to the next presenter, and I'll be here to answer more questions. Thank you. Before, before you um, 
uh, turn the mic over. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the process of putting this declaration together. Um, I'm always interested in the process of how these things um, come out and you know, were there particular points of contention? How did you work through those? Can you just talk a little bit about, about that? There, there really wasn't points of contention. It was just, uh, I guess, maybe verbiage. And um, what we did was, uh, like I said, it, it, it was a conversation that was held that informally for almost like four years, uh, we knew we were, we were addressing um, um, mo uh, again, mostly around uh, the GMO and GMO corn issues, because again, the the wind pollinates your corn, and uh, you know what what were the implications there? You know, a, a natural process, but all of a sudden, uh, the way the laws were reading is that if that pollen drifted into our cornfields, basically one our corn is contaminated. And that the corporations own that corn. That's what we were understanding. So we wanted to put out a a statement saying, um, you know, we're we're against that. Um, it was again, it was farmers uh, sometimes just talking uh, in the fields. Um, but that conversation broadened into our other neighbors, the Hispanic farmers here in northern Mexico have a, a healthy um, culture of agriculture. Um, usually um, family, family scale farms. And uh, we all sort of know each other and it, that's how we um, got to talking about it. We, we actually had a couple of people that were um, um, younger people that were going to university and they were bringing us a lot of this information. It's like, whoa, do you guys know what this is going on? And um, some information um, was rumors and some uh, not so much. And um, so I believe when we decided to um, create this document, the declaration, um it it was it took about two weeks to to actually write and it was we we um tapped uh one of the young men that was going to university he actually finished a phd in uh um i think it was genetics or something like that uh, but it, um, he was the one that um uh his name is miguel uh stefan maybe a lot of people know him and um, it was a conversation that we had between, he was the writer and there was probably four other people that were um, um, uh, feeding them our viewpoints, both from the, the Pueblos, Native American viewpoints and from the Hispanic communities viewpoints. And so that's how it came together. Uh, we came to a final draft and we hosted a, a seat ex seed celebration, seed exchange in a uh, community of Alcalde. We read it, it was uh, ratified by all the farmers present and then adopted and passed. Um, a day after that, um, several other Pueblo communities in the North um, adopted resolutions, basically um, reinforcing this de uh, declaration and a few days after that, this is um, March 11, 2006, um, it went before um, two other uh, political um, entities in the North, one is called Eight Northern Indian Pueblos Council, and uh, what is then called All Indian Pueblo Council, which is a consortium of all 20 Pueblos in the state of New Mexico. So we have, um, there's a, um, a, um, resolution um, reaffirming what uh, came out in this declaration. So what you need is farmers uh, educated in um, the threats to the seeds, but also in educated in the um, uh, ways of um, knowledge of traditional, uh, I guess, seed husbandry, if you will, and um, some young people that um, um, 
can do some research and some of the some of the uh, uh, writing. That's how. how it awesome! Came Thank you so much. I wonder if we could pull back Don Tipping. Are you there, Don? Still, if you could just click the share video button again. I can bring you on the panel. Don, are you there? Let's see, I think I saw him in the people list still. Looked like he was outside though. Maybe it's a tough connection. Or Jack, do you wanna jump on here and until John, uh, Don is able to join? There's Jack, okay. Hey, Jack, <laughs> welcome back. Greetings, friends. Um, so I wondered if you wanna weigh in on this conversation and, and talking about the role of a kind of declaration document that we could rally around. I think this is, you know, coming out of the seat summit, Slow Food USA, um, I should have introduced myself. I'm the director of Slow Food USA, and we have a, a, quite a broad network of about 115 chapters throughout the U.S. and um, a national working group dedicated to the Arc of Taste, which is like our catalog of biodiversity. And we, to my knowledge, and Carolina, who's from Slow Food International, can jump in here. But we've, as Slow Food USA, we've never like put our stake in the ground and said this is what we believe in around seeds. And I. Um, you know, listening to the conversations during the seed summit, I can see um, an important role in us doing that and in us um, being sure that we are listening closely to indigenous farmers, especially and to others in the this um, open seeds conversation. So I just wanted to turn the mic to you if you have any thoughts on that, any guidance and how we might approach this. Well, surely, uh... At least speaking from my organization, which is the Open Source Seed Initiative, and with a global coalition of open source seed initiatives, uh, I think that we are part of an increasingly large movement that recognizes that the world is not going the way it needs to for all of our survival, the survival of the beings we share this earth with. That seeds are a critical component of all of that and that all of us and here i see don is coming back who represent various organized sets of people uh, can surely be usefully taking a position on seed sovereignty sovereignty in a whole variety of ways but those of us who are particularly interested or in working with seeds yes in doing that i think to think about who we are, who we're speaking for, before we put that down. And I think speaking from some kind of organizational perspective is absolutely the way to go about it, and it's an important thing to do. So if slow food is, is that what you're implying, that slow food is considering taking a position, then I think that that and then anytime anybody makes a statement, one needs to start with who are we making the statement on behalf of and what authority we have to do that. Uh, and so from our perspective as an open source seed initiative, We've not done that explicitly, except in our pledge, which could be considered really uh, a statement of what we are all about and what we're doing in two short sentences. And that's our sense of that it could be interpreted that way. We haven't expl explicitly thought so, but I know that John, who's with us now, uh, has been involved in some other activities. He's a member of the open source scene initiative, but also as many of us are working in other organizations and taking 
other positions. So I would welcome his comments on how he sees this movie. Hey, Don. Thanks, Jack. I, I think you're muted. Um, Don's muted. Don, Don's muted, yeah. Don, can you hear us? Um, Don, we can't hear you. I think you're muted. And it seems maybe you could try turning your video off. It seems maybe the connection might be weak. Um, Clayton, I like your comment here of statements and declarations are a big help when we go to governments to support seed sovereignty. Um, there's a political role of these kinds of statements. Let's see. Don, can you unmute? I don't know if he can hear us. Email. <laughs> Send him an email. Can you hear us? Sorry, folks, this hop-in platform is new. I think maybe it doesn't work as well on phones. Um, in the meantime, as we wait for Don to see if he can unmute, I wonder if anyone else on the panel would like to join in and um, contribute to this conversation. I, I, you know, we've had a lot of panels and listening. Um, and if anyone else would like to share from your perspective, I see a lot of folks in the in the chat here, Evie and um, just Jim, Carolina, if anyone here would like to jump in and share your perspective, just click the share video and audio. And this can be a more informal space where we talk about um, how we can come together and have um, some strong unity for slow food. I think Carolina is coming on. Here we go. Hi Welcome, there. Carolina. Hi. Carolina is part of the Slow Food International staff in Italy. Thank you for staying up so late. This is super <laughs> late for you. Um, yeah, and fine. she facilitates a global seed group. So welcome, Carolina. Thanks for jumping on. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And um, I was here uh, for these last two sessions that were very inspiring, very good quality of the discussion. Um, I just wanted to um, say a few words uh, about uh, Slow Food work on seeds. And uh, maybe Don can hear us now, he's connecting. <laughs> or not. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so um, I I think that uh, as Slow Food International we have a position paper on seeds uh, and uh, also one on GMOs, which is going to be uh, updated in uh, in this year. Um, so we already have several statements on seeds, but I believe that. Um, as we are going on to work as a, um, with the with international uh, working group on seeds, and hopefully there is going to be other summits as this one as Slow Food USA is organized. Uh, I believe this uh, is a very good opportunity to start collect collecting also which issues characterize more. The, 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 the United States situation on seeds and what do you feel and believe we should um, put in the center of the discussion. Um, this is why I, I, you know, I also suggested to have uh, this session because uh, after all these discussions are the first three days, there's going to be more, of course, um, and much more we're going to 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 be uh, brought in the in the discussion, bringing the discussion. Um, but I think that uh, starting collecting all uh, all these um, perspective from different countries and the, the, what we, which are the needs, which are the um, which are the, 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 the things that we want to put in front uh, on, on these issues worldwide. 
but starting from also collecting from this regional uh, summit are extremely important to to have a, a more uh, global view uh, on this. Thanks, Carolina. Carolina. It, it is, um, and and um, if someone wants to get involved in the global seed work, do you have recommendations? Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> we are now um, also uh, doing, uh, as I said at the beginning, we have this international working group on seeds. Anna, Jeff, Clayton also are part of these. And at, since now, it has been more like uh, also, Sarah is the part of this, and actually, uh, um, lots of people that are in the committee who are organizing this, this summit uh, are in the group. Oh. Sorry, oh. my connection went. <laughs> oh, no, go ahead, go ahead, we hear you. Okay, so what we are trying to, um, to do with the group is uh, to um, going further with the uh, the definition also of a, of a global strategy on, on seeds and uh, that's is what is going to be the, the program probably of this year so really do a participatory process in uh, uh, build the strategy and the view of our of our movement on on this very very important topic which is seeds uh, we already have so many projects that involve the, the conservation and the carbon of seeds um, but um, the, we have to uh, animate the, the the network behind all those projects and we uh, must go um, to, to, to strengthen uh, the, the, the synergies and the collaboration that can uh, um, that can uh, uh, born from from this network. So this is a little bit the the, the, the aim the, of of the group. So you can you can my my you can write to us. You can write to Anna to Slow Food USA if you would like to join. And uh, we also are thinking of maybe organizing in more regional chapters. Uh, we will see, <laughs> but. Um, this is a bit the, the, the aim of, of the group uh, this year, so. Perfect, thank you. Don, can we, yeah. there you are, we hear can you, hear you hear us, yes. I can. Sorry I was having such glitchy, I think it was my mic and my <laughs> headset. Anyhow, I, I really appreciate all this discussion. Uh, real quickly, my name is Don Tipping, I'm out here in southwestern Oregon and I'm currently actually out at the ocean with my family uh, on Tolowa land, the Rancheria band of the Tolowa native people of the Smith River area here. And I've been farming for 30 years and growing seeds for most of that time. And I just thought it would be helpful to share a bit of perspective. When I entered the seed space, the organic seed space in the mid nineties, the, there was a lot of discussion around public domain seeds. And I think that seed saving has always been this like defining element of agriculture like if you weren't saving seeds you didn't have agriculture so seed saving and seeds inherently were always a decentralized element clayton you touched on this really well yet we live in a highly networked world so how do we have both that that, that paradox bridge that gap between decentralized like we want the knowledge in as many hands as possible we don't want big corporations or entities holding, uh, you know, the intellectual property or the actual physical seeds. Yet, how do we network cohesive understandings of sovereignty? And for myself, I've been teaching seed saving and uh, for 25 years here. And we do this seed academy and we make it available for anyone, whether they have money or not. Um, just to try and get those skills in the hands of more people. So again, I feel like the discussion around seed has gone from pub, uh, you know, traditional indigenous stewardship of seed to this public domain understanding to open pollinated and now this kind of open source and now slow seed. So how do we weave all the people in the seed space which have really disparate 
views on this and we want to honor their own, you know, decentralized, like land based uh, individuation around this idea. And I, I can't claim to know what that answer is, but I, I feel like, again, bridging that we want it to be decentralized. We need to have, you know, strong, resilient seed systems in every significant watershed on the planet where agriculture is practiced with well-adapted, open-pollinated genetics and a good um, exchange of information with the traditional seed keepers and, you know, an organization like Slow Food Movement that could create a more cohesive understanding. So as people approach it, we can explain, like, what is this? What are you doing? And because it's constantly emerging against the political, sociocultural backdrop of just the evolution of culture, which is inherent. And as more people are interested in where their food comes from and, and where the seeds that grow the food, and and and, uh, and I think we have to kind of name the elephant in the room and of the organic industry by and large doesn't want people to know that a lot of the seed that grows the food is not being stewarded by the farmers growing the food themselves, is coming from multinational corporations, is not necessarily organic, uh, possibly includes uh, questionable IP patenting uh, technologies, uh, legal stuff. So in a way, I feel like this movement that we're discussing runs counter to some of the ways that we tokenize seed uh, and, and in terms of like commodifying it and that we also uh, dissociate seed as the central like heartbeat of what makes a annual crop based food system work. And so, you know, again, it kind of makes me think of that Vandana Shiva uh, quote where she talks about that India had 30,000 varieties of rice before the Green Revolution and, and then eight after. And so we've gone through this bottlenecking uh, culturally in our food systems and how do we uh, bifurcate back into a really uh, you know, diverse system that is going to look really different depending on where you are on the planet you know, what the, the sociocultural uh, backdrop of the work that you're doing. And for myself, I've moved away from growing seeds for farmers to more growing seeds for gardeners because I see there's a lot more space to have that dialogue because uh, food is an easier um, table to sit at than commerce, which is where most farmers are doing this work to make money to do their lives. So I think that that you know, could be a powerful element of it. It's really including just the gardeners of which there's, you know, tens of millions out there and they have a lot of sway. So again, I will just kind of close with, I've been mulling this idea around a lot. And I think COVID in a lot of spaces that we all uh, function in our lives is teaching us that decentralized yet network solutions will be the emergent um, areas where there can be growth and uh, success and novel uh, approaches that connect back to our roots and ancestral ways and traditional lineages. Thank you. I appreciate that. I think decentralized and networked is um, <laughs> a, a hallmark feature of slow food. It's, it's messy and it's complicated, but also um, like Clayton was saying here, there's already a lot of tribal resolutions. There's already documents. We don't have to start from scratch, but we can kind of, how do we coalesce and bring all these documents together into something that um, creates some unity? Um, one of the favorite slow food sayings is they are giants, but we are millions. We are the multitude. And I think that's what I'm trying to key in on with with this summit as a starting spot with the, you know, we run this campaign called the plant to see campaign where we're trying to connect the dots between small growers, school gardens, home community gardens and chefs. And I think it's what interesting what you say in that the, the food space is maybe a, a good place to enter this conversation for folks and to get it into a broader conversation, um, maybe an easier place than farmers. That, that's an interesting distinction there. 
Well, it, you know, it occurs to me that the title of the session is what, uh, creating a sovereignty, seed sovereignty declaration of some kind. I think you've got to be really careful. Sovereignty is not something simple. Uh, it means an awful lot in different ways to a lot of people, not least our first peoples. And sovereignty implies all kinds of things, including power and ownership. And that all depends upon that. That in itself is really variable. It has a lot of people taking very, not necessarily opposed, but different positions, depending upon who you are and where you are in the world or even in this country. And a declaration of sovereignty is something that I would be very, very careful. And I'm not sure how, what kind of sovereignty I might have over seed. I think that other peoples and groups have a better sense of what that sovereignty is. And I'm not sure initially that slow food is the place to talk about sovereignty, unless you're supporting the sovereignty of people who feel they do have sovereignty. Maybe it's maybe you know you're 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 better off on talking about where slow food as an organization. And again, I go back to my initial comments that to talk about sovereignty, you know who you need to know who you are speaking on behalf of. Yeah, Jack, I, I mean, slow food is a very broad organization, and I wonder if you might not start from the position of understanding what seeds are. You know, farm to table is something that's clear. And I think maybe clear to a lot of people who are in slow food. Why not start talking about breeder to table and figure out what that means and who, what that all along that chain. And I, I myself don't know what I would claim to be sovereign over in seeds. I just want to clarify and, that uh, I made up the name for the session and I was based it on the fact that we were going to be starting with what Clayton was providing for us and using the uh, seed sovereignty declarations as sort of a template, but we absolutely do not know what this should look like. Anna obviously has more of an idea, but this is definitely very new to Slow Food to um, be trying to um, take a position on this. And so I so appreciate you saying that because it was one of those words that seemed to make sense from what we were going to be learning about today. And, um, but, and yet we definitely have not said that's what we need to say in our statement. So I guess that's why we're here today is to try to figure out, well, what is the appropriate position and what is the, the sort of angle and, or maybe we're more of a, a network provider, maybe we're a, a, a repository of information or something like that. And that that is the better way, um, the better purpose for slow food to be reaching out and helping, just like we did with the summit, to bring people together in that way. What do you think, Anna? Allison, I, I keep, I, so I've been working on planning two summits at the same time. And besides like a logistical um, jumble in my brain, um, there's a lot of parallels between the slow seed conversations and the slow fish conversations. And I put this in the chat in the other place, but the slow fish crew is talking a lot about the blue commons um, as a contradiction to blue growth. And I think there's a lot of interesting parallels here as we talk about the commons and the seed commons. And this goes into your open source idea. And, and I wonder if there's something there with how, how to, um, you know, this is about the people and about like a, a shared understanding of, of openness as opposed to privatization. Um, does, that, does that resonate, Jack, with, with your perspective? Yeah, although we, 
the commons is itself pretty fraught. Scenes were regarded as the common heritage of mankind and as a commons. Now, and a commons was never the way it is conceptualized now predominantly in Western thinking and academic thinking as an open access resource in which anyone can have anything they want. It was always embedded in a cultural or historically it was and is most accurately understood as embedded in a particular cultural context on which there were rules and norms and regulations, formal and informal, about how an access, access to a resource was regulated mm -hmm. and used. That got manipulated by corporations and Western thinking and academics into something that was simply open and became you know, the tragedy of the commons, something that no one had any control over. That was never what it was. That's what it became. That's what the public domain essentially is now. That's what we in Aussie are objecting to. That all that means is that whoever has the biggest shovel digs out <laughs> more than anybody else. That's what a commons is. That's what we call open source. We a, a protected commons or public domain plus. You we. Our position is that you may use any of our seeds in any way you want, as long as you give that same right to anyone else. But it, with Native American peoples that we talk to, we are not trying to impose that on anyone or make that the singular definition of what anything ought to be. That's the way we are working when the scenes that in some sense, we have some sovereignty over, though I'd never call it sovereignty. Native American peoples, I think, who have been asked to share and share and share to their disbenefit and exploitation, naturally have a different vision of what that might be and have not seen our open source framework as one that mm -hmm. necessarily works. Uh, I think that there are many, and that isn't to say that what we are doing in Aussie isn't in some senses parallel with or compatible to, or certain things we can share and certain things we don't. But I think that any attempt to define what, especially globally, a commons is or sovereignty is, is something to be done with great care and a lot of consideration and as you're doing talking to a lot of different people and now i've got to stop talking for a while i've been talking for a while. but you asked and that's that's the way you know and john is part of aussie but may not share all of those but just to clarify jack so i i agree with you about the, like the original way of thinking about commons is like a protected space and you're saying that's what you're more aligned with rather than the newer, like anything goes public domain. Is that, am I understanding correctly? Okay. Yes. Is that, who was that guy that did tragedy in commons? Whatever his name was, I forget it now. But the, the slow fish, the blue but, commons, I think is aligned with that earlier understanding of the commons as a shared resource that needs to be managed um, together. Well, my point is only that yes. there are many, many, many understandings of commons. You know, if you want to talk about seed sovereignty, Via Campesina has probably, the, you know, and Vandana Shiva has been mentioned. They are similar, but they are not the same thing. And there are real fault lines mm -hmm. everywhere. And standing with those faults and who you are representing or purport to represent is critical in talking about anybody's vision of a commons or sovereignty, it's always tied to someone's perspective. You better understand who that is, what that someone is, who that someone is. Don, go ahead. And then maybe we can bring it back to Clayton if you uh, have any thoughts on this. 
but um, Don and then Clayton. Don, you're super quiet. Okay. I'm in conversation with a, a man named Jose Luis Ortiz, who's helping the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance define some uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, concepts. And we were discussing how, like, you know, the ultimate teacher for all peoples, original peoples in particular, was nature. And you look at how seed works with nature. And, you know, going from permaculture, we say design from patterns to details and develop that nucleus and radiate out. Seeds are just given freely, like get picked up by birds and then the fur of animals and distributed. Just it's a an unstoppable process. So, I mean, that's the great comment, like to use the, the analogy of the ocean is just the the natural reproductive mechanism of plants disperses seeds. It's vital to how life works. So anything we as humanity like uh, add on top of that has to be consistent with that functioning. And there's there's a paradox there because certain people stand to gain or lose by that you know fundamental uh, truism of how nature works. And that's I I you know feel inner tension around that too as somebody that earns a living growing and selling seeds. Um, but I do think it's important to you know, de develop a list of like, all right, slow seeds, what are we or what are we not? And then, you know, kind of keep the bar to entry low and over time in different communities, it will look different, just like Jack was mentioning. Uh, and it's difficult to develop a blanket uh, set of guidelines around seed because we have thousands of years of relationship uh, in different cultures. Clayton, do you have any any feedback on this? You just have to unmute your mic. Okay, yeah. Um, the document that I first mentioned, the Declaration of Seed Sovereignty, the living document for New Mexico, um, it, it was, um, I guess, designed so that people could um, um, read it, maybe understand it, and uh, change it into whatever um, uh, verbiage they would want it to, depending on their particular situation. Um, we did choose, uh, deliberately choose the word sovereignty uh, because uh, tribal governments are um, sovereign entities within uh, uh, U.S. and Canadian borders. So we have the rights, the sovereign rights to govern um, uh, how we see fit within our uh, within our borders. Um, and again, it was uh, that that word was chosen to address what we had seen as real threats to our ability to um, um have and continue to grow our seeds uh again back to the the threat of uh, gmo corn especially you know the pollen drift and so forth you know it the you know like uh don was saying that uh, nature uh has its own laws its own rules and corn especially you know the the wind takes the pollen wherever it wants to go. And, and sometimes insects do the same thing with corn, they'll, they'll pollinate. But um, th that, you know, we couldn't, um, we couldn't artificially create, uh, uh, a, uh, we couldn't use a political border to protect our seeds, but we could do it um, using um, our uh, ability to create um, tribal resolutions and laws within our own border. So that way, somehow we thought we were going to be, we could be protected. Um, one of the other um, uh, tribal groups in the United States and California um, passed a law banning uh, GMO salmon. I haven't seen the final version of that. That was a few years back, you know. Um, so maybe some of that could be looked into also. I haven't seen the final version. 
Um, as for slow food, using the word sovereignty, um, that's up to slow food, um, you know, and the writers. Um, but I think maybe um, depending on how um, the statement does come out, uh, at least um, there should be something in there saying that they uh, slow food supports um, uh, farmers, farming communities, uh, indigenous people in their ability to um, protect their seeds as sovereign uh, entities. Um, you know, so that, that again, like I said, um, uh, I've used some of the other uh, documents that have come from, um, um, especially um, uh, the indigenous um, slow food network uh, statements and so forth. When I've uh, made presentations to, um, with even within our own communities. You know, it 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 bolsters our our positions, knowing that um, our fight here, say in northern New Mexico, is uh, is bigger, and there's other people that that support our positions throughout the globe. So I encourage, um, you know, um, that slow food um, take this task. Like I said, it took us four years to come up with a three page declaration right and you, you have to include obviously you have to include the farmers right um and young people and um maybe even um uh, people that are more more i guess keenly aware of uh um i guess laws regarding seeds that we were covering we're not um, making any mis mistakes in our in our language here. Thanks, Clayton. The the phrase "nothing about us without us" always comes to my mind when thinking about this kind of thing. And that if we and as we work together on this, it certainly needs to be a representative group together working on this. And I've really enjoyed the the group of people coming together to plan this summit. Um, and to me, that's a central part of any work that we do. It needs to be collaborative and include diverse partners from across the, the seed community. So I, Sarah joined, I wonder if you have something to say, but I also would love like if anyone listening here would like to be part of our working group moving forward, just um, uh, maybe I'll put my email in the, in the chat and you can just reach out to me. Um, we haven't talked much about what we're doing as a working group past the summit, but I would I would love to um, continue having a structured conversation to work on things like this. So um, please send me an email if you're interested in being part of that group. But Sarah, I'll pass the mic to you, and then we have to wrap up before it's too late. Um, it's going to be dinner time here on the East Coast soon. Perfect. Yeah, I, I just wanted to give my perspective. I'm, I'm obviously new to the US and I'm new to all of these conversations, but um, I do feel that um, putting a declaration about seeds really brings the conversation down to something that's very tangible about what slow foods position is in the world. In the sense that, you know, there's there's still a little bit of the rhetoric in slow food that it's a gourmand organization, that it's just about the, you know, the, the wine and cheese and so forth. But I feel that the centering it around seeds very easily deconstructs that and shows where that decentralization takes place and who are these different people who are actually um, the core of what this movement is about and so i think it's really important for us to articulate that because it really allows you to then very clearly in a short presentation articulate what this organization is really about by by bringing that in with all the things that we've talked about today so making clear statements you know maybe sovereignty is not the word that we're going to be using but a clear statement anti-gmo and what that represents and why that gmo has threatened the livelihoods of small scale producers of indigenous sovereignty of 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 so just you know clear statement of what what gmos are 
why we're against them, you know? And then on the other hand, like clear statements of what we are defending. So what Clayton was just saying right now, statement about how indigenous communities have the right to define their own seed sovereignty, we defend that, you know, we are here to protect and defend that. So I feel like it's important for us to articulate some of these things. And there's a lot that came out of these discussions, but it will allow us to be a better, better able to articulate who we are as an organization. Thank you, Sarah. I'm signing you up to help us with <laughs> this process. Any other last thoughts from folks either in the panel watching, feel free to jump in any last thoughts or from the panelists here before we wrap up. Again, this is like the beginning of a conversation and we have three more days next week to continue um, talking about all of this. One day is focused on local grains and local grain economies will be really interesting. And the next day is seeds and community but we'll be focusing on community seed banks, libraries, um, schools. And then our last day is a keynote with Karen Washington and um, a session about the plant a seed story. So looking at some of the small seed companies that have um, partnered with us for that, that campaign this year. So lots to come. I'm excited to continue the conversations. Be sure everyone registers for that week. Um, the link is in the reception area. But any last thoughts, Clayton, Jack, Don, Don, Don left, but um, any, any last closing thoughts here? I, I just put uh, a little thing in the chat that I've been thinking about, um, you know, because we've been dealing with that here in the state of New Mexico, um, there was, in, and it happened in other states neighboring that um, the multinationals bring their people in and they're trying to get these last laws passed for the states stating that um, they want just the experts uh, to have, uh, I guess, um, controls over the seeds, right? And um, so I've been thinking about it is like, um, you know, they're throwing um, not only the patent life forms in with our seeds, and and saying well we, you know um, this is uh, you know we have we want we need to have control over these because we're the experts. But I've been you know I'm not a legal expert or anything like that. Um, I, I think maybe um, if we redefined um, you know again it's a, a more concerned about uh, GMOs at this point that uh, if they they have you know they give. The, those seeds a, a different legal definition and I'll, I'll say they're not even seeds anymore because they you know they have a different legal definition so um you know if if, if they could, that discussion could be i guess thrown around a little bit um and and fleshed out a little bit more uh we, we can somehow um um separate, I guess, the uh, the good seed from the bad, if you will. Um, lastly, um, the other thing I've been toying with, and uh, I haven't gotten any feedback from our, our uh, alliance or the other collaborators I work with is actually um, in Native American communities, we can, we can get um, certain um, um, sites designated a sacred site, so like Chaco Canyon, it's an archeological site, um, you know, um, it's not a, um, a tribal, like tribally owned lands at this point, I think it's federally recognized archeological site. And there's other places like that, that could be, that can get protections as sacred sites. And um, I'm, I'm looking around and seeing people would like to, um, uh, chime in on a discussion of actually having our fields um, designated as separate sites and there'd be some protections granted towards that. Uh, you know, the seeds and everything else that goes goes along with that. Um, and, you know, again, this is all just from uh, more of a indigenous or tribal perspective, but th that's where I'm coming from. So, you know, it's a way of uh, addressing some of our concerns and um, if 
you know, I, I found um, a great ally with Slow Food, Slow Food International, Slow Food USA, uh, all these years, and um, you know, um, I'm continuing to uh, hope for that um, th these conversations and that support will um, be lend it to um, our communities and our farmers. Thank you, Clayton. Me too. Excited to keep working together. Okay, thank you everyone for an amazing weekend. Big shout out to Alice and Jeff who behind the scenes yes. have put so much effort into coordinating this program, getting people's tech checks and confirmed and everything. So thank you to both of you. Thank you, Sarah, for curating this day of conversations. It's been really amazing. So um, thank you again, everyone.